Hi, Jamel. Hey. How are you doing? I'm, uh, I'm doing pretty good. How are you? Excellent. Well, uh, nice to be talking to you here today. Uh, I suppose uh, the first thing on our agenda that we, we decided we might want to talk about was the, uh, the budget uh, and some right. of the uh, sort of continuing uh, budget negotiations, the entitlement debate, all of this, it's all sort of, you know, if you're, uh, if you're a pundit in Washington right now, there's, there's really way too much to do. I mean, it's sort of full employment time for pundits. You've got a war, <laughs> a budget battle, and entitlement reform on the table. So, uh, right. so you know, I, I, there's, uh, there's, there's plenty to talk about. Um, so I guess, um, you know, I mean, just sort of the for, – for folks who, if you haven't been paying attention, the, the basic situation is that we're, you know, on yet another continuing resolution. We're funding, we funded the government for about three weeks here, uh, and there's sort of a game of uh, a budget chicken going on uh, in, in Congress with John Boehner stuck in the middle. The uh, the Democrats are sort of are, are pushing, uh, are, are increasingly confident in some ways that they don't need to go for the cuts that a lot of Republicans want, while the more conservative Republicans have basically indicated to John Boehner that they are not interested in anything, uh, in, in much of a compromise uh, from the, the 60 some billion dollars in cuts that they've proposed. Um, and so, uh, so here we are, we've got the government funded for about another three weeks. Nobody really knows where it's gonna go from here. And, uh, and, and, you know, and, and John, including, I think, uh, John Boehner, uh, as far as I can tell. I don't know, what's, what's your read of the situation? Um, I mean, that sounds about right to me. John Boehner, on one hand, it's sort of impressive that John Boehner's been able to um, wrangle his caucus into supporting you know, more than one continuing resolution. Um, on the other hand, it's very clear that, as you said, certain Republicans just aren't interested in... Um, compromising any further, and especially not from their original package of cuts. Um, I think, you know, with, with the last continuing resolution, I think that we're on the on the way to a government shutdown of some sort. Um, with this simple reason that I'm not sure if there's, you know, I'm not sure, I'm not sure the Democrats, well, I know the Democrats aren't willing to, you know, go any further, and John Boehner doesn't have that much more leverage, it doesn't seem, with the more conservative elements of his caucus. So when I talk to people on the Hill, you know, uh, Republicans tell me that they don't want a government shutdown. Um, I take it Democrats don't want a government shutdown here. It seems like there's you're, there's a sort of a, a, a weird situation in which neither party really wants to go ahead and shut down the government, but at least certain elements within both parties have decided that maybe it's worth it if the other party uh, doesn't give in a certain way or doesn't, you know, sort of doesn't play ball their way. Um, and I, I am still, you know, I, I think there's some Republican belief that a government shutdown uh, would uh, would end up being bad for Democrats. I'm I, I'm not sure I'm too confident in that um, assessment. On the other hand, I, I don't really know. You know, I mean, do you do you think that there's any good evidence, uh, you know, either way besides just sort of, well, you know, the, the public likes it when the government keeps working. Um, I mean, do we, do we have any real idea, besides looking back, I guess, you know, at the, the Clinton era shutdowns, um, how that would play out politically, you know, sort of who would get the blame? And the other question I guess I, I'm uncertain about is, you get to the point of a budget, uh, of a shutdown, uh, you know, there's an impasse. It still has to be resolved somehow or another. Right. Um, and, and it's like, at that point, what happens then? I mean, at that point, negotiation has just become a lot harder because the stakes have become higher. You know, sort of the animosity between uh, the parties has presumably uh, increased somewhat. So, but at that, but you still have to do something. You can't just, well, the government's shut down. You can't just walk away and leave it at that and, and try to claim victory, you know, in the PR battle somehow or another. And so I don't know. I don't really, uh, you know, know how this plays out, um, just because it looks like both sides, you know, sort of have an incentive to try to work together, and I'm not seeing that all that much from, uh, you know, from really, for at least from crucial, um, influential elements on either side. Um, I mean, to, to sort of go at who would receive the blame, I'm not entirely sure either, but my guess would be that. You know, the public remembers 
the 1995 shutdown, and if anything, I don't think Democrats would have a hard time portraying these, I mean, like, both because it's true, and because, like, um, this crop of Republicans have been you know, very, very vocal about their opposition to government, it wouldn't be terribly difficult to, to portray them as being the cause of the shutdown, even if Democrats are also unwilling to budge from their position, though, though to be fair, um, in Democrats' favor, they do still control to, or at least, you know, the presidency and, and the Senate. And so I can, I can understand why Democrats would be unwilling to go any further than they've already gone, given that um, they're actually still, you know, the majority partner in the federal government and, and that Republican, Republicans only control one House of Congress. So let's say we get to that shutdown. I, I, I'm sort of at a loss for scenarios, uh, you know, post shutdown. What, what, if, if that happens, uh, then, then I guess, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, when I talk to people on the Hill, they say, well, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it, and that's about it. We don't want to get there. That's, that's all they tell me. Yeah. Um, and, and it suggests to me that, uh, I, I mean, I don't know how much planning is actually being done for that type of situation. No one really wants to get there. Um, and so everyone's just sort of crossing their fingers and hoping it doesn't happen. I mean, maybe it doesn't. Maybe, you know, maybe everyone sort of realizes uh, that they've got these two and a half weeks to work it out and, and, and go forward somehow or another. Um, I suspect that would mean, uh, you know, sort of the, some of the more conservative elements uh, of the Republican Party backing down somewhat, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, the most, uh, they would perhaps have to do the most significant backing down at this point, just sort of making the argument for, you know, for sort of maintaining the, uh, an operating and functioning government. Um, but, uh, but even still, like, I, I just don't see where, what happens once you get there. Do you have any idea? I mean, is, have you heard anything, you know, that's sort of relevant or useful? I mean, I haven't, I haven't heard anything. Um, and likewise, I can't, you know, I don't, the, the, the path going forward didn't seem particularly clear to me. Um, you know, if to avoid a shutdown, what you would, I think the only thing, I think, I think to avoid a shutdown, the only thing that could, that, you, that needs to happen is for one set or the other to be absolutely convinced that they'll lose politically from a shutdown. Um, I think right now, like, I, I, I don't know for certain, but my conjecture would be that Democrats are probably pretty confident that they would benefit politically from a, from a shutdown. And I think Republicans um, yeah. might also... So are a lot of Republicans. Them. Right. Yeah, certainly, um, it's probably true that enough Republicans think so. I, right. I mean, there is there is a lot of, uh, of uncertainty about it within the Republican ranks, even maybe in some corners, you know, some of the more conservative, uh, you know, sort of small government uh, pro, uh, you know, pro cuts corners uh, where you might not think. However, there there are also a lot of folks, uh, as my understanding, who are relatively confident that they could uh, use this in their favor. But like you said, you know, sort of, I think it's interesting that uh, how how little is really known about what the government, you know, sort of what state the government is going to be in four weeks from now. Um, I mean, it's like Hollywood. Nobody knows anything, right? It's what William <laughs> Goldman said about screenwriting. Um, you know, where in the end, uh, we're, we're, we're sort of, well, I don't know. Um, the predictions are hard, especially about the future. Um, so, I mean, I, I guess, you know, sort of going back to the, uh, the actual debate, uh, you know, sort of what, about what to do rather than just sort of the politics of the shutdown, I sort of find the approach frustrating on both sides. You know, I mean, to me, I, I see Democrats, uh, and, you know, and, and a lot of their supporters um, making uh, the Republican cuts out to be, you know, this huge, impossible, uh, you know, sort of apocalyptic, you know, government slicing, this really sort of uh, radical and irresponsible approach to cutting government. Um, but they're not actually proposing really huge cuts. I mean, they're, they're not even proposing to take us back to the level of spending in the Clinton years. They're not really proposing to take us back to the level of spending, uh, you know, uh, throughout, mo uh, you know, throughout much of the Bush years. Um, and, you know, and Republicans, on the other hand, I think, are sort of crazy for taking a stand over cuts that ultimately uh, are not, that, that are relatively small and ultimately are not going to solve the deficit problem. 
Um, and and I, I guess you know, sort of, I see on the one hand, it's it's Republicans who are sort of, you know, putting their foot down and saying, well, this is this, you know, this is it, uh, and this is what we have to do. But it's not enough. And Democrats who I, I don't, you know, I think if the Democrats have a problem here, um, it's that they that they don't have uh, they don't. It, it, I'm not sure what they stand for. Other than a continuation of, you know, basically a continuation of the status quo. And understandably, that's popular, but I don't think that that's what you could do. You know, that's actually something that works uh, budget-wise going forward. Um, I mean, two things. First, I don't think, you know, I think you have to, when, you're, when looking at Republican actions on the budget, I think you have to start from the position that the deficit isn't actually that big of a constraint for Republicans. Because um, if it were, they would be open to at least some sort of taxation, even even regressive taxation, right? Like, uh, the, the Republican... We have a, I mean, you, you have guys like Tom Coburn who are pushing this line, you know, of, like... I mean, he's he's relatively careful. He's certainly not, a, you know, taking a, a hard liberal line of, we just got to raise taxes, we got to bring in new revenue, you know, like, let's... He's not taking that line, but he's out there. As I mean, what it looks to me like is he's he's out there doing what he can to sort of try to soften up the Republican base and the Republican Party for the possibility uh, that tax hikes might have to be part of a deal. Right, but there's no. I mean, there's no real indication that his position has any traction among the people who would actually vote for a deal that raised taxes. Um, I mean, like so far. And given that there isn't really any appetite for tax raises on, you know, progressive or progressive or, or whatever, it seems to me that the budget conversation um, for Republicans is sort of just a mask for, like, uh, cutting programs that they don't like, which is totally reasonable. I mean, I, I have no I have no real, real, real argument with people who say to themselves, I don't like these programs, and here is an excellent opportunity to cut these programs that I don't like. Um, but I, I do think that if, you, if you're looking at it in the context of deficit reduction, you're just going to be totally confused, because if the focus was actually reducing deficits, then the like, Republican move make absolutely no sense. Like, why would you focus on NPR so much when NPR is like pocket change to the government? Um, why would you focus on defunding the because SEC? Because Ted that much on, you know, missiles, uh, you know, shooting Libya last week. Right, right, right. Like, you know, the cost the cost of uh, uh, the the action in Libya could easily top a billion dollars, but, you know, the House, House Republicans are focused on defunding the SEC, which in addition to, you know, being necessary to you know, preventing another financial collapse, um, doesn't cost that much money. So, right. No, no. I, I, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, I, I, I don't favor um, taxpayer funding of NPR, but the amount of political <laughs> energy that has been spent on trying to defund NPR, you know, it's sort of um, compared to how much we actually, how much money we actually spend on, uh, you know, on, on funding NPR, um, is totally out of proportion, and it does suggest that that Republicans are going after political targets. Rather than uh, rather than actually making an effort, uh, you know, sort of a, a serious policy effort to uh, to focus on deficit reduction. On the other hand, as Democrats keep pointing out, uh, Democrats are actually right that the public doesn't want to see uh, the big entitlement programs cut. Like there's there, I mean, the, the polls are actually pretty clear. And you know, I, obviously, I I, I wish uh, that they said something else, but the polls are pretty clear. The public is not comfortable with big entitlement cuts right now. Um, and so Republicans, it seems to me, have taken that as a, well, we can't really go after that today. I'm hoping, you know, perhaps in the future, but we can't go after entitlements today. So what we're going to do is we're going to go after sort of uh, soft political targets that we think will rev, uh, you know, rev up the base. Um, and I'm just not sure, like, in the end, I'm not sure how good a strategy that is at either uh, you know, making it, yeah, either politically and certainly from a policy perspective, um, it's, you know, it's basically meaningless. I would really prefer them to be making, to be doing in some ways what Paul, what Paul Ryan and, uh, and Senator Coburn are trying to do uh, in, in, in various ways and make the case slowly and methodically 
for entitlement reform, and that something has to be done with these, you know, with uh, Social Security, with Medicare and Medicaid, uh, and that something has to be done relatively soon uh, to, to reform those programs so that to make them sustainable um, and, uh, and, and to get the budget on a track that we can, you know, that, that's going to work 10 or 20 years down the road. Um, but I don't, you know, I don't see the bulk of Republicans doing that. I mean, a few things. Um, first, I don't see Republicans doing that, but not, I mean, I'm sure there are definitely Republicans who want to see entitlement reform, but the simple fact is that Republicans, as far as their votes are concerned, depend on older people. Um, and at a certain point, there's only so much, you know, Republicans are going to do to to reform entitlements since doing so could, like, hurt their standing with the main source of their votes. And but, in okay, so I don't... In presidential elections. Um, I mean, like, I, I, I also, you know... Go ahead. No, I, I, I get that. Um, and I get why you why Republicans politically think that they have to say that, uh, you know, have to be against cutting Medicare and can't talk about Medicare reform and can't talk about Social Security reform. But look... The, if you look at things like, uh, if you look at Paul Ryan's roadmap, Paul Ryan's roadmap doesn't touch Medicare one bit for anyone who's within 10 years of the system. So anybody who's in the system now, their, uh, their benefits won't change. Anybody who is within 10 years of the system, whenever his plan passes, their benefits won't change. So it's not as if, uh, you know, seniors are actually at risk here. And I, I feel like, I mean, obviously, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of misunderstanding on, on, you know, on entitlement, how they work, uh, what the reform plans are. But like this is, it, it seems to me like that is a surmountable problem. I mean, even the uh, the Social Security plan, you know, the, uh, proposed by the uh, by the President's Debt Commission is actually, you know, it. it I, I I guess with that one, I don't even understand why why liberals uh, aren't more for it. It um, raised the uh, Social Security um, income uh, 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 cap. Uh, for, for taxes. So, it, so you're collecting more taxes out of people who make uh, six figures. Uh, and it actually made the benefit system more progressive so that the bottom quintile is going to get more money than they would under the current system while making uh, the entire system you know, more sustainable. And I, I, I just did not see a lot of liberal love for that plan. Um, and I don't, I don't understand it. I don't understand, you know, sort of why, why seniors are, are so worried about a Paul Ryan plan that doesn't cut their benefits. And I don't understand why liberals are, you know, haven't come out uh, more in favor of a, a social security plan that is that raises taxes on people who make six figures and uh, you know it gives better benefits to the the poorest people in America. Like I, I, this I mean, is, I think I think I think I think the, the liberal hesitance that come up for you know the symptomable social security plan or really any that doesn't simply involve tax hikes um, is simply you know the concern that. Even ra even something like raising the retirement age would seem totally reasonable. Ignores the fact that for the vast majority of people collecting social security, or maybe the vast majority, but a large majority of people sort of collecting social security, by the time they reach the current retirement age, it's not like they're in like a great position to work anymore. Like most people, you know, like most people are working jobs that you know either manual labor or like service jobs that at a certain point um, you can't really do when you're older. Um, and so, like, raising the retirement age, you, even, even if it seems like a reasonable, even if it's a reasonable sounding policy, in practice, you know, made you harm, to har made you more to harm a lot of people than actually, um, you know, and that may not be as, that may not be worth the long-term savings it could create, especially since the Social Security, Social Security as a program isn't really in that dire shape, right? Like, if you if you do the long term, well, I mean, compared to Medicare, it's not uh, I mean, but like, in that but dire in, shape, and it's not true, as big a, a long term budget problem. That that's true, but it's not. I mean, you can't sustain the current benefits. You know, uh, it, the the program is on an unsustainable track. Uh, I mean, there, but, but, you know, there are trillions of dollars in unfunded liabilities, um, and eventually, uh, sooner, hopefully, rather than later, it's easier if you do it sooner. Something is going to have to give either benefits. Will you know will not be paid out? Uh, taxes will be raised, or you know, or the the benefit uh, plans that will be adjusted somehow or another. One of those things is going to happen. I mean, but there's I mean, remember there's trillions of dollars in unfunded liabilities if you're taking like an eighty year time frame. And like, given that current baby boomers aren't actually immortal and aren't going to live forever, and given that 
there will be people entering the You're workforce. talking to a libertarian, yes. remember, so, you know. <laughs> I mean, sure, yeah, um, I mean, I, you know, I'm just saying that, like, g- given given all the contingencies of the, of, the, of the economy and budgets over, you know, the next 20 years, much less 80, like, you know, Social Security doesn't appear to, doesn't appear to be, me to be in a dire shape. Like, a few tweaks here and there every few years will keep it going along fine without any major, um, any major damage to, like, the overall budget picture. Um, I agree, right, that Medicare and Medicaid and really healthcare costs across the economy are the dro- main driver of long-term, um, long-term debt and deficits. And, of course, you're going to like, disagree with me here, but, like, it seems to me that Democrats have already taken the lead on trying to trying to do something about that. Even if you don't believe that the Affordable Care Act will um, arrest long-term growth in, in a meaningful way, the mere fact that Democrats voted for something under the under the assumption that it would shows that at least one side of this budget debate has the appetite for doing these things. Um, so I mean, but so so this is, though is that if you look at what what is. How is the Affordable Care Act trying to bring down uh, bring down costs in the long term? A lot of that comes through IPEV, which is basically empowered to do one thing, and that's make quality blind across the board reimbursement cuts um, to uh, to to physicians, and eventually uh, after 2019, some other types of providers. Um, it's a little more complicated than that, but that's the the, the basics. And to me. I, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I just, I, I like politically. Um, even if you think that's a good idea, you know, from a policy perspective, I don't see how that plays out politically um, because Republicans and doctors and hospitals are going to come, you know, are, are basically going to be doing the lobby, you're directly lobbying seniors and saying, look. They're cutting our, uh, you know, they're cutting our payments. That means we're not going to be able to take you as a patient. That means we're not going to be able to give you the same quality care. And even if that's, even if there's a, an element of ex- exaggeration, to some extent, it's certainly true. We know that when payments drop to a certain point, uh, as in Medicaid, it, uh, you know, service becomes harder to get. Um, and so, when the government is controlling the payment system, uh, as it's as it's planning to, you know. Th- uh, for in perpetuity here for, for Medicare, um, it doesn't strike. It strikes me that there's such an obvious sort of political response that it's very unlikely that even if it were, you know, sort of were going to work from a policy perspective, um, that that members of Congress, both Democrat and Republican, are really going to let this go. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you know, sort of eventually something gives, and that's what it is. But uh, but I just don't see it happening. I mean, so you know, going back to the why aren't Republicans? Um, really investing the capital and trying to make the case for entitlement cuts. I mean, this sort of just goes like the politics. The politics don't really work for anyone, right? Like even with cover yeah. um, from the other side, you're gonna take a political. This is why libertarians are so unsuccessful in politics. <laughs> um, so I think I think the important facts about the current situation are that um, as far as like it comes to addressing long-term costs like so far the only group of people who have been willing to take a political hit even if it's i mean i i think the affordable care act will be you know have an impact over the longer term but even if you don't think that's true even if, even if you see it as a symbolic move um really only democrats have like been willing to take the hit for that symbolic move and so i think you know and, and given that republicans aren't even willing to entertain um you know, non-entit- like non-entitlement cuts that would have an effect on long-term deficits um, or medium-term deficits, um, like cutting military spending or whatnot. I think you're left with a picture that says, that shows rather that Democrats um, and sort of like, you know, broadly speaking, people on the left are willing to, you know, at least entertain the idea of long-term deficit reduction and Republicans simply aren't. And I think it's just sort of like, it seems apparent to me that it's like a fool's errand to hope that Republicans are going to change an ideological view that's like basically held slave for the last 20 years. Um, Again, with the, you know, the libertarian thing, this is why we have uh, no hope in either party. Um, but no, I mean, I'll, I'll give Democrats um, like a, a half a cheer for being willing to pass <laughs> a bill that, uh, that uh, cut 
Medicare. Um, whether you think those cuts are, you know, we'll, we'll table the, the whether, you know, whether that's bad, whether it's good, you know, sort of how, how what, what problems may or may not arise. But, like, they, they did go out on a limb to some extent and pass a bill uh, and really, I mean, really work hard to pass a bill um, that allowed Republicans to run ads over and over again saying they're going to cut $500 billion from Medicare. And so half a cheer for Democrats for being willing to do that. But Democrats passed that bill, uh, did, you know, passed those Medicare cuts in the context of, A, um, a big new insurance benefit for the middle class that they thought uh, – what, that you know was they thought was going to be um, politically beneficial to them, and b just the general hope uh, and and belief I think that uh, that the politics were in their favor and that people would come around and like the bill. You go back and look. I mean, Politico's done articles on this. You know, it's it's, it's actually relatively well. The, uh, the White House uh, pollster uh, was you know was in the Washington Post saying that look, once we pass this thing, it's going to redound to our benefit. Um, you know, we're gonna we're gonna see electoral victories. Because of this, going to be able to run on it. Well, as we know, very few Democrats ended up running on the Affordable Care Act. Uh, in fact, I believe more Democrats ran against it than ran on right. it, and almost every Republican ran against it. Um, whether or not it actually hurt them is very hard to say, but we know, I think, that it did not help Democrats uh, in the last election. And so, they, should, you know, we, we, but I, they, they yeah. thought that they were going to get a benefit from this. It wasn't like they were sort of nobly stepping out and, and taking the hit for cuts thinking that, okay, this is just what's got to be done, that they thought that they were, you know, that there was a, a political, uh, that there was political gain from this. Right, but I think, you know, they, they thought it, they, they were, it's sort of, it was sort of a cost-benefit thing, right? You know, like, they, they knew they were going to take hits for the cuts to Medicare and hope that the eventual benefits would play out and help them. And so I think, I think that, I mean, even if you're only willing to give them half a chair, if you have half a chair, it's well-deserved for being the only, um, being sort of the only Group of people in the, in, the, in the current situation will not even go out on that much of a limb to um, to reform entitlements in a meaningful way. Um, again, I just don't. I mean, I just like I, I I both understand and don't understand disappointment with Republicans for not going further. I, I, I as someone who um, like yourself who's on the right, I understand that you would want. Um, at least, like your nominal double travelers, to be a bit more serious about this. But just like given their given given the general pattern, and given the fact that Republicans have just never seemed particularly interested in um, cutting entitlements, or at least like reforming entitlements to make them more sustainable, if there are other priorities um, available to them, like defunding things that they don't like, um, or, or defunding things that liberals like, which seems to be you know roughly equivalent. Um, and like cutting taxes on the wealthy, like if those if they can do those things and not touch entitlements, I think that's what they're going to do. Um, you know, the the rhetoric of Paul Ryan, notwithstanding, who himself is like you know gradually coming close to admitting that they're going to put off entitlement reform for the near future, which effectively means never. Uh, I, I guess the hope here is that uh, entitlements become one of those pro uh, programs that Republicans, uh, by and large, don't like, and that means both uh, elected Republicans and Republican voters, and, and that makes it eventually an easier target. But uh, I certainly think that without um, without pressure and without a political case being made, that's going to be very difficult um, to sort of to, to move this on a little bit. Uh, one of the interesting things I saw, you know, sort of uh, was – it, when we're talking about cuts, you know, the, the big areas to cut are, uh, are the entitlement programs, uh, the health, mostly in, in health care, Social Security, um, you know, and then but then there's also defense. And that's traditionally been, a, you know, just a, a total, you know, Republicans would not touch it at all, would, you know, would only think about increasing the defense budget. But I'm actually... Um, you know, I, I was very skeptical that, you know, Tea Party types or, you know, sort of any of the new class of Republicans were going to go after uh, the defense budget at all um, beforehand. But I'm actually sort of like very, very slightly hopeful uh, that, uh, that Republicans might start looking at the Pentagon and saying, wait a minute, um, there's a lot of waste there. There's a lot of money that we're spending that, you know, uh, that we... Uh, that we don't need to spend, and that and that that is and that 
you know, um, what was it? Haley Barber the other day said, right, right, you know, right. that if Republicans uh, aren't cutting at the Pentagon, uh, that they don't have uh, credibility elsewhere. And, you know, and perhaps even, you know, even if it's only that sort of obvious a political ploy of, uh, of using, as a, using it as a credibility play, I'd love to see it. Um, and I, I guess, I'm, you know, I'm sort of curious what your, uh, what, what you think the chances of uh, meaningful cuts at the Pentagon actually of Republicans supporting that, you know, actually are. Um, and if there's, you know, sort of how willing um, or interested uh, liberals are in, in working with uh, working with the right, working with uh, small government folks on, on getting rid of some of that. I mean, obviously, there would end up being compromises um, and, and right. sort of uh, that. And, and as we've seen, budget compromises um, are, are few and far between these days. But I think... You know, I, I generally think that all politicians are all, like, you know, parties are driven, are fundamentally driven by electoral gain. They're, they're, they're trying to figure out how they can, you know, how policy positions help them with voters or whatever. And so I think, you know, I'm glad to see that Haley Barber is um, staking out a position and defending cuts as, a, as possible to differentiate himself from other Republicans, because what it means is that there's probably some, like, group of Republicans in the party who are sympathetic to defense cuts, and like if Haley Barber, you know, grows in stature as a presidential candidate, this could bring that set of that set of the, that set of the Republican uh, party into the fore, and maybe like make it something that's actually discussed by Republicans in a very public way. Um, and so, I mean, I wish the best of luck to Haley Barber, and I hope that like other Republicans begin to perceive some sort of like electoral or political game supporting defense cuts, because I really think that's the only way it's going to happen. Um, if it, it is if, like, you know, no one's going to, no one's going to, few people go on the line for being responsible, uh, unless there is some sort of, like, gain, something we gain from it. Um, and, you know, if Haley Barber, even if Haley Barber ends up conceding as a presidential candidate and defense cuts have nothing to do with it, the mere fact that he's coming up for defense cuts would... Um, encourage others to do the same. And I think that there is a real appetite among liberals who, you know, as far as I know, sort of complain about defense spending all the time um, for cutting, you know, cutting money from the Pentagon. I wouldn't be shocked um, if there were, if there were, comprom if there were a bunch of compromises to be made, like the first place I, I would think would be, you know, liberals agreeing, liberals enthusiastically agreeing to cut money from the Pentagon in, 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 you know, in trade for other cut, for cuts elsewhere, I think I think liberals would take that deal. Um, I, I hope Republicans would take it too. It's sort of my my I, the, uh, the the fantasy I have of, of big budget cuts at the Pentagon um, is that uh, that foreign military spending essentially becomes the new foreign aid. And because if you look <laughs> at you know sort of what people want to cut out of our budget. Uh, you know, what everyone says, we don't need to be spending, you know, we, let's solve the budget problem uh, by cutting foreign aid. And of course, foreign aid is, you know, less than 1% or whatever of our, our total right. yearly spending. It's a drop in the bucket. It makes no, I mean, we should perhaps be cutting it, but it, it makes no significant difference in terms of the overall, uh, you know, sort of long-term deficit problem. Um, but if you, you know, but it, it strikes me that perhaps, uh, perhaps if only because we have a, a Democrat, um, in the White House, uh, there's you know sort of a, a chance uh, to to talk Republicans through this uh, and and to argue that no, that you know the the biggest expense long term in the military budget um, is foreign deployment is keeping troops you know is, is keeping up all you know sort of all this overseas presence that we have right, um, right. and that perhaps Republicans you know uh, I, I mean how long that lasts if it if it sticks you know at t until whatever point uh, Republicans win the White House again however many years down the road who knows but it, it strikes me that there's at least an opening and if you you know if you look at what's happened with with Libya uh, which we haven't talked about. Um, uh, if you, there's actually uh, a fair amount of, uh, of uncertainty on the right, I, I, I understand that a number of Tea Party types, you know, sort of do support this. That they're, you know, and certainly uh, the, the Weekly Standard, Bill Crystal types are are, are 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 still in favor 
Right. I mean, but, there's but like there is more there antipathy, you know, than there was, say, amongst Republicans for the, the Iraq War, right? Like, it's right. there's definitely a lot of internal, con a lot more internal conflict that could potentially be leveraged. Um, but that's maybe that's a cue to talk about Libya here. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but it, it sounds. I mean, this is sort of the bright side of partisanship, right? Like the 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 the, the, the good thing about hyperpartisanship is that, like, when it comes to things that you know, with the Libya intervention, um, because Republicans are generally going to oppose whatever the opposition party does, like, it's, this is good. It's good to see Republicans oppose Libya intervention, um, along with liberal Democrats, at least some liberal Democrats, um, because otherwise, like, in the absence of that kind of, like, high partisan you just, you, you'd probably just see some, like, bipartisan consensus, much like the one that surrounded Iraq, at least among lawmakers. Um, I mean, on, on the other hand, the problem with it is that it 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 is very hard for for conservative Republicans to um, form an effective coalition with True. liberal Democrats over an issue like this, even when they agree, because you know there's there's so much animosity or at least suspicion on either side, and your base is so you know makes it so difficult to uh, to hold hands even for a little while. Uh, right. Right. I, I guess I'm, I, I'm sort of curious, you know, I, I know you're, uh, I, I take it you're somewhat skeptical of the uh, liberal, you know, of the, of the uh, intervention in Libya. Um, yeah. Uh, but I'm a little curious about your read just generally of, of how Democrats are reacting to this. It seems like uh, Republicans are uncertain to some extent, uh, but also, but Democrats are also uncertain about this to some extent. I, I think, of, so, you know, I just, I, as sort of a broad read of the situation, I think that if Libya intervention were being done by George W. Bush or by really any Republican, that you would see widespread opposition from Democrats. Um, you know, like most things, I think that the the Democratic reticence, or at least like you know, the fact that even those opposed aren't super vocal about it, is a sign. Is sort of a, a, like a factor, a factor of partisanship and like team playing. You know, like. Obama's on our side, um, and for that reason, we're going to hesitate a bit about our opposition. That said, I do think that at least among, um, you know, I think you're seeing a familiar split, a familiar split between liberal Democrats and like more moderate and centrist Democrats. I think liberal Democrats are deeply skeptical about foreign interventions in general, even ones with ostensibly humanitarian you know, goals. Um, whereas modern Tinder's Democrats are just more generally more willing to go along with these sorts of things. Um, for my part, yeah. I'm re I'm really skeptical as someone who you know whose like formative political experiences were in the the lead up the lead up to the Iraq War, or one of which was the lead up to the Iraq War. Um, I'm just very very skeptical of any sort of, like, intervention into a country we don't really understand for hazing, no reasons, with no real, no real, uh, end game plan. Um, no, I, I mean, that, that's the thing. I mean, even when, you know, when, when we went into Iraq and I didn't know, I mean, I, I was not, you know, um, nearly as, uh, as involved um, in the day-to-day -day politics, you know, sort of paying nearly as much attention. That's, you know, that was my question then. What is the end state that we are trying to achieve and what is the clear path to achieving it? You know, sort of what are the, the road, you know, the, the landmarks along the way? Um, I remember, you know, when, when Bush uh, gave his first speech, you know, announcing that we, you know, uh, that we, that we'd sent bombers in, like it really wasn't clear. It, um, it was clear what he didn't like about, uh, you know, it's sort of what we were against, but it wasn't clear what we were for and why we were going right. in. And I think the same thing is true in Libya. There's there's bad stuff going on. It's clear that we don't like it. We, we strongly disapprove. Um, but what are we actually playing at? And I, I don't know that anybody knows here on this. I don't know that, I mean, you know, I, I think there are, uh, I mean, certainly there's some partisan, you know, some, some war boosters on, on uh, here in the U.S. who are, who are looking for... Um, a full-blown, uh, you know, intervention of some sort or, or something closer to, very close to it. Uh, but for for the president, I don't really know what he's, uh, what the what the White House thinks the end state is here. You know, and they've done this weird thing where America's not leading, 
uh, they're sort of hanging back, but they're leading from the rear and and so like so how are we going to dislodge ourselves from this conflict? You know, is it going to be um, and and if we do dislodge it before there's some sort of clear victory moment, um, how is that going to play in the public? I mean, the the public, even if they're worried, you know, tends to even if they don't like getting into these things, uh, or they're at least somewhat uncertain about it, they hate getting out before we've won, you know, before there's right. a clear, uh, you know, we put our foot down, planted the flag, you know, popped open the champagne, and that's victory. And if we don't have that, so, I mean, it strikes me that we're stuck until, politically, we are at least potentially stuck until we have that flag, you know, flag planting, champagne popping moment. I mean, this is what's very frustrating about the whole conversation, right? That, like, there are always, for these things like these, there are always more questions than there are answers. But, like, in terms of how we talk about it, it seems that people who are like, oh, we should go help these people are never faced with those questions, right? Like, like espousing, you know, saying we shouldn't intervene unless we have, like, some reasonable answers to some very reasonable questions is treated with, like, super scrutiny, but saying... We should just go like bomb the bad guys because Gaddafi is a bad dude, and we should do something about bad dudes. It's like you know, of course. I think a, a big no question to ask that, is that a lot of folks very reasonably aren't paying super close attention to this, and presume that uh, the people in the White House and the people in the Pentagon are. Well, of course, it's not to say that the the people at the Pentagon or the people at the White House are asleep at the wheel, but right. they don't always have. Uh, the detailed plans and the clear, you know, sort of end goal in mind um, that I think a lot of the public sort of trusts that they've got this, you know, taken care of. And, and it's not always true that they have, you know, sort of we're just going to walk through it this way and it's going to work like this. And they know how it'll they know how it'll get done and they know how they'll get out of it. Um, and and so you have this this problem of an unengaged public. Uh, which normally, as a libertarian, I think is a good thing. You know, I, uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm generally in favor of, of people not uh, basing their lives around, you know, sort of uh, around the political sphere. I mean, um, I, I don't. But in I this case, there, there are problems so. with, like, you know, yeah, you, I don't. You have people in that much. Nor should they really. I mean, normal people aren't this involved in politics. Yes, that that is that is very true. I think you know the, the the only other thing I would say about this is that um, is that this will probably uh, the the intervention in Libya and what Obama has chosen to done there I suspect will be the end uh, you know more or less the end of uh, of any sort of lingering support for um, uh, libertarian libertarian support for Obama. Uh, because now, you know, you knew, libertarians knew he was going to, they weren't going to like what he wanted to do on the domestic policy side, but I knew a lot of libertarians who said, you know, uh, he is, at least we're not going to get involved in any wars, at least we're not going to be, you know, uh, bombing foreign nations, killing people in the name of America, any, at least, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll actually reduce the amount we're doing it, but instead we've gotten engaged in, in a third conflict um, and I suspect that, you know, sort of the, the libertarians who had held that out, you know, sort of as their hope for it, this is, you know, well, I was still right about that. Um, uh, our, uh, I mean, that's, you know, when, when it came to McCain and Obama, I, I wasn't, I didn't really like either of them, but I, I did think that ultimately Obama was probably a better choice just because, you know, we're, we're, we'll be dropping fewer bombs and, you know, and, and less quick on the trigger than we would have been with McCain. And now I... I don't know how true that is. I mean, this I is. I think there may be less to some, to a small degree. I mean, if you saw what John Bolton was saying uh, about yeah. you should have ground troops in there already, <laughs> completely crazy stuff. But that's sort of the sort of thing that would have a voice in a McCain administration. Perhaps, right. perhaps it's a you know a very tiny degree less. But the, I mean, we've still we've 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 gone in to a third country and started dropping bombs, uh, you know, started uh, shooting missiles, and uh, in and. And with no, you know, with, with, without even, like I said, an end goal, which means that we could be stuck there for Lord knows how long. I mean, I'll, I'll totally cop to having voted for Obama for, you know, for, for similar reasons um, that, you know, this guy seems like he's less likely to want to intervene in other countries. But sort of in retrospect and like reading over his public statements and doing more, a more careful reading, it does seem like that, you know, Obama's always left his options open rhetorically for supporting something like this. You know, there's the 2000, 
his 2002 speech against the Iraq War, when he was like, I'm not opposed to all wars, opposed to dumb wars, um, in the Audacity of Hope, there's an extended section about how the United States is, you know, responsible for other countries, um, or at least responsible for, like, global security and how, like, their time from the interventions are okay as long as they have international legitimacy. His Nobel Prize speech, likewise, um, he, like, sort of reiterated that theme. Um, so I sort of feel like this is one of those instances where I think Obama supporters should have been paying a bit more attention um, to his public statements. Um, uh, on the other so, hand, like... Was there a more anti-war candidate who was really available, who was more, you know, more plausible, who was at least as plausible or nearly as plausible? I mean, the, if yeah, you I mean, presumed, I, as, as most of us did, that it was Obama or Clinton on the Democratic side, there's no question who was, uh, right. was going to be less prone to, to foreign entanglement. I mean, ultimately, that, this is an indictment of the, of the political culture, right? There simply isn't really space if there ever was, for a politician to say, I don't think the United States should be, like, intervening in countries for like, even humanitarian reasons, um, or, like, using the American military, at least, to intervene for humanitarian reasons. That sort of was taken as a given from, by, by all mainstream politicians that, like, the United States has the right to do these things. Um, and, like, anything less, saying anything less um, is a recipe for, like, being branded you know, not a serious contender for high office. Yeah, I mean, the, the closest you get is like a Ron Paul type. Um, you know, maybe a, a, right. a few of the uh, of the I may or may not be Democratic Socialist uh, Democrats. You know, um, folks who right. are, you know who've made it to the highest levels of politics in some ways, but are still on the fringes of you know sort of uh, of, of of the Washington establishment in in some ways. Um, yeah, but. Uh, I don't know if there's if there's anything else you know you, you want to say about Libya. Um, you may be following it a little close more closely than I am. I'm sort of I I, I, I look uh, you know at the New York Times and, and a few of these these places and just sort of find myself uh, I end up having to look away. Um, that's yeah. that's about all I can do on it. Um, it's so incredibly frustrating. But uh, you uh, you were telling me that there is uh, a Daredevil movie reboot uh, in the works, yeah. you know, sort of if, if uh, so that I guess the, uh, hopefully um, none of our, not too many of our, our, our viewers have uh, seen the Ben Affleck original, which was it's just terrible. It's terrible. Uh, but <laughs> but it, it strikes me as like a, it's always struck me as a really obvious property to develop and to do something uh, really cool with. Uh, what, what, what are right. they working on though? I, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm what, not what are, entirely sure. Um, I'm not entirely sure right, about the details. Yeah, as far as I know, the proposed, I mean, the, the remake that's being made is going to be a sequel to the Ben Affleck movie. So it's not, it's not like a, it's not like a reboot in the proper sense. It's more like um, Superman Returns. Superman Returns is basically a sequel to Superman 2, um, Richard Downey should come in too. Um, right. And, uh, but from what I understand, they're going to try to adapt the, the Born Again storyline um, when, um, Kingpin finds out that Daredevil and Matt Murdock are one and the same and proceeds to try to make Daredevil's life a living hell. Um, I personally would rather see a, a full-on reboot Batman Begins style um, and simply have someone adapt um, The Man Without Fear uh, for the big screen. Um, I know you were joking on Twitter that The Man Without Fear is basically The Dark Knight Returns, um, which I'm okay with. Um, I, I mean, Frank Miller is kind of a great writer. He's also kind of a great writer with about three stories to tell right. that he then <laughs> applies to whatever character he happens to be working on. Um, and, uh, you know, and so if you're, I mean, if you like comic books, you probably like Frank Miller, but you have to sort of come to grips with the fact that that he's incredibly repetitive, that he, you know, right. he found what works early on um, and has just very, very much decided to stick with that rather than sort of uh, trying. I mean, even like his characterizations of his heroes tend to to fall into about you know three sort of uh, th three sort of stereotypes. You know, three. I mean, you know, he's he's got the. Uh, I mean, really, if it's, if it's, if it's, for the heroes, it's all it's just one. He's got the you know the, the gritty 
uh, grim, you know, loner who, who talks to himself like, you know, some sort of uh, noir protagonist, um, gets hurt a lot and, you know, uh, considers it uh, a, a, a cruel character building exercise while he breaks the bones of, you know, whoever the next baddie on the, the alley is. Um, right, right. I mean, but, uh, but no, I, I, that's, that's interesting. Um, and it seems like a, a really obvious property. I, I'm not sure, you know, the, the born again storyline is the one I would actually, I, I would actually pick. I, I might've gone for, for something for a little more modern take, uh, like the, uh, the Michael, uh, the, the, the Bendis run, um, that right, happened right. at the, the early, uh, the, the early part of the last decade. Um, uh, uh, and, and it was this, just this great, um, kind of soap opera y run uh, that also had a whole lot of plot in it. And for a mainstream comic series, a lot of character development. You actually got to see Daredevil interact, you know, sort of with his, with the Daredevil cast in a, uh, a large number of, of different situations. And so, in the way, you know, sort of that the best uh, sort of ongoing series sort of start with the idea of, okay, we've got these characters. Now let's put them through a variety of different types of hell. Uh, that's really what Bendis did. Um, and for, for about three years, as I recall, uh, maybe a little longer than that, um, I, I read it in trade, so I don't remember exactly how long the run went. But, um, but it's, I mean, it's just, it's really one of the, the best runs in modern comics. Um, and it's, it's so character smart. Um, it almost reminds me of, uh, of a great television show, you know, of a great genre television show, at least something like, uh, yeah. you know, like Battlestar Galactica or, uh, or even like Mad Men in which it's not that there's ever a clear resolution, um, to a lot of the stories, but, uh, but they do evolve and change rather than the, you know, uh, and, and the story, you know, sort of the situations themselves really shift from, um, you know, from arc to arc, from story to story, unlike sort of the traditional comic situation, which is, uh, which in, in which the character starts in the exact same spot and, you know, and then resolves himself in the exact same sort of, uh, in, it, it, nothing ever changes in, in the comic book world. Um, and right. Bendis actually did the best you can with a, with, with a mainstream character and allowing things to change. Um, um. I was going to say the other the other sort of comic book movie news is that Joseph Gordon Levitt was I think officially cast um, as Alberto Falcone in the next Batman movie. Well, there was there there were reports um, that came out after that he's not going to be playing Alberto Falcone. Oh, really? Falcone. Falcone. Yeah. So um, there's, it's it, he's cast, but we don't know who he's been cast as yet. Um, okay. Th this came out so. Uh, I forget who had the original scoop, but I think it was then Entertainment Weekly said they had a source close to the production saying, no, no, this isn't going to happen. Um, perhaps by the time this is posted, it will all be resolved, but right now it's not clear. Uh, but it is kind of interesting that that's come up, just given, um, so, so the, uh, that character was, uh, was used in the, uh, the Long Halloween, a, um, and, uh, a Batman and story. Figure. Uh, and right, and Dark Victory. And it's the Jeff Loeb books. Um, I right. think I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Uh, the the Jeff Loeb books, and which I always felt sort of under delivered, but they had like a core of a really interesting idea. And Nolan seems to be mining those books. I mean, the uh, that all uh, those books. But he took a lot of elements out of those books for the first two movies. Um, yeah. And so it's interesting to see him going back to that well. I mean, I think in Alberto Falcone casting, it would work as far as the sort of the broad storyline of the movies are concerned so far. And it would be, it would make sense given uh, Man Hathaway's casting as Selena Kyle. Um, you know, since in the context of the Long Halloween and Dark Victory, Selena Kyle actually might be a more important character than Catwoman proper. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, well, I guess we'll find out a little more. I mean, this comes out uh, next summer, uh, right. I, I believe. So we've got a, we've got a no, it's summer 2012, so we've got a little more than a year here. Um, but it's interesting to sort of see these things sh take shape. The, you know, we also saw uh, that Dar Darren Aronofsky um, dropped out of the, the Wolverine sort of sequel. Um, and, uh, and then this summer, of course, we've got uh, a couple of big comic book films. We've got Green Lantern and Thor and, uh, and Captain America coming out. And it's really sort of... It's interesting to see all these these characters that I read, you know, when I was nine years old uh, in funny books, you know, sort of imagine these these big worlds playing out on screen that Marvel, uh, at least, 
um, which is doing a lot of crossovers with their movies, has really decided, okay, we're going to take our entire universe and we're going to put it on screen. Uh, and and yeah. the creative control that they've exercised and really turned this into a sort of huge branding, exer you know, sort of uh, you know, cross uh, cross character branding exercise, not just for any individual hero, but for the entire Marvel universe. And they're they figured out a way to share that really geeky, nerdy thing that you know, I, I'm guessing you had when you were nine years old too. Um, <laughs> that like you know most like nine year old comic book fans were like you know right. spent a lot of time like figuring like dealing like thinking about the crossovers and thinking about like you know okay what would happen if Wolverine fought. Daredevil, if, you know, whatever, like all these, you know, sort of silly uh, things that that, that nine-year-olds spend way too much time thinking about. But Marvel, um, Marvel's figured out how to take that and make it really accessible to to I mean a huge mass audience. These movies are tremendously successful, and it's right. it's been really interesting to sort of to watch that and see them translate translate what something that was very geeky and, and sort of very uh, very narrowly targeted. At a certain class of young male, and translate that to uh, to you know to the majority of under thirty Americans are you know are, are familiar with at least some of these uh, Marvel superhero movies, which is a crazy, which I mean is kind of a crazy thing to think about, right? I mean, Iron Man is a second tier hero, or was up until like, the movie came out a few years ago. Three yeah, three years ago. Um, yeah, and that, that was like, huge. That, like, right, that that Iron Man is like just about as recognizable as Superman now is actually a really big deal in terms of, like, geek is concerned. I mean, he's arguably more popular, right? I mean, are the, right. super, the Superman comic books aren't selling... They, I mean, the only... With the exception of the Grant Morrison All-Star Superman run that was a sort of a, a split-off from the main series, the Superman comic books um, only sell sort of legacy issues. There's no sort of... There's no buzz around them. Uh, whereas the Iron Man books that are being written by uh, by Matt Fraction, um, I think he's still uh, on the series and a little behind, but uh, like are, are selling really well, um, are like a central part of the Marvel universe now. Marvel has been again, you know, very smart in retooling not just their not just taking their comic universe and translating it to the screen, but then allowing the screen to reflect back on what they're doing in the actual comic books. Right, um, and and like Superman. Superman's nowhere right now. Maybe after uh, after the Zack Snyder reboot here uh, happens, he'll be you know he'll be he'll be back on it, uh, you know, sort of back in the number one slot. But right now, it seems like uh, like Batman and Spider Man and Wolverine and Iron Man are all sort of uh, are, are trouncing uh, the big guy. Yeah. Um, well, awesome. We're I think we're at about an hour here, so I don't know if. I uh, think we are. If, so uh, uh, I, I, that's probably a, a good place to stop, but it's been uh, fun talking to you, as always. And as hopefully always. we will uh, do this again sometime.